Okay. All right. So uh, 14th Sunday in ordinary time. Um, you know, Matt, Matthew and I were, were looking at um, possibly trying to do like some type of, of, of like, you remember when Chris used to do the day retreats or she would have like, they would be on Friday evening and Saturday morning. Matthew and I were talking about wanting to do something like that um, at some point. And uh, we were looking and, and this year for whatever, you know, just because of how the dates fall, we actually have two full months between uh, New Year's and Ash Wednesday. And uh, so I just kind of made me think about, you know, we're in the 14th Sunday of ordinary time, but then pretty soon you jump into, you start getting into Advent and then you start over and, and but, um, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. All right. So let's go ahead and we'll, we'll begin with our prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, watch over us by day and by night in the midst of life's countless changes. Strengthen us with your never changing love. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And uh, today, if you did not know, is the feast of the, the first martyrs of the, of the church. Uh, apparently, though, not, I don't know if that counts St. Stephen or not, but uh, the first martyrs, I think he has his own day, but, but the first martyrs of the church. Okay. So, so these readings, um, I, I, I think they are, on the one hand, they're very on the nose, but then on the other hand, especially with the Old Testament reading, uh, I, I think it does need some explanation uh, if we want to get past the surface of it and, and really see what's going on. And, and I'm hoping what you'll immediately see is how how the Old Testament reading uh, very much relates to the gospel. So I'm going to start with the Old Testament reading, but then we'll. But, but I'm going to. I'm not going to do too much explanation on it, and then jump right to the gospel because I want to keep that connection. Okay. So the first reading is is from Ezekiel, and one of the things I think that is important to remember about Ezekiel is he is a prophet and he is going into the northern kingdom and i think this is where it gets confusing so this is after the kingdom has divided so after you have uh, uh after king solomon right um israel divided into israel in the north and judea in the south israel is the 10 there are 10 tribes uh, that were that became Israel and two tribes that became uh, Judea and Jerusalem is in Judea and so as I'm reading the 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 passage from Ezekiel keep keep that in mind so the Israelites that Ezekiel is speaking of are not they are not the Israelites meaning all of the Jewish peoples they are literally the people that live in Israel. And when he's also talking about the, uh, their rebellion, so what happened was when the kingdom was divided and they were separated from the temple because uh, Jerusalem is now in another kingdom. So they had a king that I think he was maybe the second king. He decided to build his own temple. Uh, he was going to build a temple in Israel, and but it wasn't the true temple. It could never be the true temple because it was not in Jerusalem, and it did not have the Ark of the Covenant. So uh, they actually, and I'm not kidding, they actually built a golden calf or a golden bull and put it in that temple, which you would think, really? Um, I, I believe that was mentioned previously, and it did not go well. <laughs> Uh, but but that was what they decided to do, and 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 there is a lot of uh, so um, a lot of archaeologists they they look at so the golden bull uh, was a pagan god that was commonly worshipped in that area, so that's why they went with the golden bull. That said, then what happens is they are conquered by the Assyrians. 
and that is where the diaspora happens, right? So the Assyrians, because a dia meaning 10, right? So the diaspora and, and the, the division. Um, so what, what happens is the, the 10 tribes are then divided by the Assyrian empire and they, they take pockets of people and they relocate them to other parts of the Assyrian Empire, and they take people from those parts and bring them into Israel and, and like a forced relocation. Okay, and the Assyrians do this because uh, now you have a bunch of people that have to live together that do not have a common language, they don't have a common culture, they don't have a common religion, um, they don't have any kind of shared history. So they're much like they're, they are much less likely to be able to come together in any meaningful way and rebel against the Assyrian Empire. Okay, so um, so a lot of times, even with Jesus uh, and with some of the other, you you hear and 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 I think there's a good reason why people thought this. Although Jesus was saying no, it's bigger than that. Um, when Jesus talks about going out to the ends of the earth and bringing the people back. That is what a lot of people thought that he meant, um, that they would go out to the ends of the earth and collect all the Jewish people who were scattered because of the diaspora and, and bring them back. Um, but Jesus actually meant something much bigger than that. He meant actually going out and, 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 and bringing everyone under the fold. If, if you want to even really, I don't know how many of you have... Um, are, are interested in, in kind of the, the history of it, but I think it's really interesting too that it's in the 19th century when you start to see uh, in the United States and in Europe, you start to see the, the rise of what would be the Zionist movement, right? Um, the idea that all of the Jewish people would eventually get back to Israel and they would reclaim uh, Judea and Israel and Jerusalem, and it would become a Jewish kingdom once again, and it would be the the light to the world. That's that's the Zionism that you that you hear uh, that you hear about. And uh, after World War, obviously, it did not happen. But um, but after World War II, when the British Empire gave um, gave Palestine and Jerusalem. Uh, to the Jewish people and said that they could settle there, that, that was, uh, there was kind of this resurgence of Zionism and, and Jews from all over the world left where they were uh, to move back there. Um, so this is just kind of, and so this is kind of the beginning of all of this you see in, in Ezekiel. So, uh, so let's look at what Ezekiel says. He says, as the Lord spoke to me, the spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard the one who was speaking to me say, son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites. So again, remembering the Israelites are not the Jewish people in general. The Israelites are those people living in the northern kingdom that have been separated from the temple of Jerusalem. He says, I'm sending you to the Israelites, rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have revolted against me to this very day. So what does it mean to say that uh, they rebelled against me? Their ancestors revolted against me. They, they went kind of, I guess you could say, almost like full pagan, right? Um, they, again, they, they built their own temple. They started worshiping pagan gods. They started intermarrying uh, with pagan, with, with the pagans that were being brought in. So they were essentially paganized. Um, if you want to read, which I think is, is, is maybe even a better illustration of this than Ezekiel, but very short, you could read it very quickly. Uh, go into your Bible and read the book of the prophet Hosea. Uh, Hosea is, if you remember, Hosea was, he was the prophet who was writing about his wife, uh, Gomer, remember? that kept that she was a prostitute but he loved her and married her anyway and uh she kept running off and and committing adultery and he would chase after her and bring her back and then they would have a happy marriage for a little while and then she'd run off again and um whether or not that really happened i don't know 
Nobody really knows, but the, uh, the, the symbolism there is that Hosea is God and the wife is Israel, um, that Israel prostituted itself in a sense by they, they gave themselves over to foreign gods, right? Um, so they were committing adult, they were, they were, they prostituted themselves. And then the idea is God will, God will bring them back. That's what the prophets were doing. They would come back for a little while, then they'd go off again and they'd go there. The whole idea of, of, of adultery um, being, being the symbolism for their turning their backs on God. And then God will run after them and bring them back. And then everything's fine for a little bit. Then they, then they do it again. So that's what's good. So read Hosea. Um, I think the symbolism in it, in it is great. And you will get kind of a, 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 a more drawn out, uh, in-depth look at what Ezekiel is talking about here. So then he says, hard of face and obstinate of heart are they whom I am sending, uh, are they to whom I am sending to you. So remember that when we get to the gospel. But you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God. And then he kind of stopped. Thus, that, that's the, uh, the prophet speak, if you will. When someone says, thus says the Lord God, meaning they are speaking the words of God. So what is he saying? He said, it doesn't matter that they are hard of heart. You speak to them with my voice and the ones that will listen will listen. And he says, and whether they heed or resist or they are a rebellious house, they shall know that a prophet has been among them. So he says, they're going to hear you. They're going to know that you are a prophet. Some of them will heed what you're saying. Some of them will resist what you're saying, but there's going to be no doubt that you are a prophet of God, that you are a son of man. And not to confuse that with son of man, that Jesus takes that role, but uh, the relationship would be that when he calls, uh, Ezekiel, God calls Ezekiel son of man, meaning one, one who is going to go represent God to these people, okay? Um, so before I jump to the gospel, does anybody have any, any questions about Ezekiel? Um, so I think it's, again, just keeping in mind, uh, in a lot of ways, the people that Ezekiel is dealing with are really, really very, very, very little difference between the, the Israelites that Ezekiel is talking to and any other group of people in, in human history. Um, they, they, they kind of become a stand in for all of us that they are rebels who have rebelled against God. They are, um, and their ancestors revolted against me and do so to this very day. Uh, some will heed, some will resist all, all of, all of this, uh, CS Lewis, he even likens the Christian life, uh, and conversion of heart. He likens it to, he says, we are like rebels who have finally decided to lay down our arms that would be a, con a, a conversion of heart that we have rebelled against the one that we should have allegiance to um and now we finally decided we're gonna we're gonna stop that okay uh jason in yeah. the lectionary commentary for this week it says our lectionary reading is an excerpt from a much longer call narr a narrative of the prophet Ezekiel. It's preceded by an elaborate vision of God's throne and the one seated on the throne full of fire and light. When Ezekiel witnesses this amazing sight, we're told he fell on his face. Ancients believed that one could not see the face of God and live. This is where he heard the heavenly voice which addresses him as son of man. And you know, when I thought we'll not see the face of God and live, you know that song, Be Not Afraid? And they, on that, it says, you will see the face of God and live. You know, that, that piece is in there. So that just struck me that, um, that, you know, because they mentioned that in here, that they said that they believed that they could not see the face of God and live. Well, that, that's, a, that's an interesting, and I know we've, we've got uh, time. So just to touch on this, um, that, that, is an, that is an interesting thing to kind of bring up because with Jesus, that is not reversed, 
Um, but with Jesus and, and with, because God has become incarnate, we can then look on the face of God and live. Um, whereas in the old Testament, that was, and you even see, you, you see it even with Moses and the burning bush, right? Where it says Moses, God, God, they use the, obviously the, the, they anthropomorphize God, but it's a like God, God had to have, God had his back. Um, and, and, or, or Moses would just see the passing shadow of God because he couldn't look on his face. Um, whereas in, in the gospels, you'll see like where Jesus says, um, you know, they say, Jesus says, you've, you've seen the father. And they say, when have we seen God? And Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the father, uh, which for a Jew, that would be unheard of that they could have looked on the face of God. But with Jesus, they are actually able to look upon the face of God. And of course, that's the promise of the new, uh, the new covenant is essentially that we are able to look on the face of God in the person of Jesus and, and live. So, so yeah. Okay. So uh, in Mark then, so keeping in mind what's going on in uh, Ezekiel and kind of, and, and, and how this is so in Mark, says Jesus, he goes to his, um, it says his native place. So we're going to assume he's, he's in Galilee or something like that, or even possibly in, in Bethlehem, probably most likely Galilee, because that's where he, he grew up. Um, and it says, when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Okay. Uh, many who heard him were astonished. They said, where did this man get all this? What kind of wisdom has been given him so they so like like uh, the, that last sentence in Ezekiel they shall know that a prophet has been among them so they know there's something about Jesus that is different okay and they said what mighty deeds are wrought through his hands so they're acknowledging that Jesus has this special uh, he is a special person uh, and for a Jew being a special person like this would mean they should, they, they have some special relationship to God, but then they immediately turn back to the rebellious side, right? And the very next one is, is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary uh, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us? Excuse me. And, it says, and they took offense at him. Okay, so um, so immediately they kind of turn on him, right, and say, well, you know, who is this guy that he speaks so well and he has all these wisdom and he's able to do these healings, but at the same time, wait a minute, we know this guy. He's not special. We remember him when he was a kid, right? Um, and it says they took offense at him. Uh, and this says, and Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his native place and among his own kin and in his own house. Uh, essentially saying the problem is they know you <laughs> um, or, or rather they think they know you. Um, and, and, and so, you know, it's kind of that whole idea of familiarity breeds contempt, <laughs> right? They, they think that they know you. You know, I, I mean, all of us can probably think of, you know, maybe like when, you know, the first time, you know, when, I, well, I, I don't go to any of my high school reunions, but if any of you ever like gone to a high school reunion and, and seen, you know, how, what, what's happening, but you still remember that person the way they are in high school. And it's hard to imagine them in a different way. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you guys, just uh, like I said, my, my high school graduating class was 19 kids. And um, uh, because it was the, our school was so small, but they like to do this thing where they uh, the senior class would always write a will for the junior class, like they would will things to the junior class. And it was it was all supposed to be very kind of tongue in cheek. And the junior class would make prophecies about the senior class. Right. And it would be like, oh, you know, we think so and so is going to be a millionaire. We think so and so is going to do this well the the prophecy that they made of me they said i was going to they prophesied that it's some that i would in i would at some point end up in jail in a foreign country 
That's what, that was the prophecy they made for me. Okay. So now it's like the people that I still know from though that time, they cannot, they, it, it is hard for them to, 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 to make the connection between where I am now in my life and what I was like as a, as a teenager. Um, and like the friends of the friends of mine that I still keep in touch with from the Marine Corps, um, some, some of them, they, they are shocked. They, they really don't understand what, what happened. How did you end up doing this? You know, we knew you way back when, and no one would have ever called that, you know? So, uh, so again, but, but, I, but I think what, and what Jesus is saying is too, is that it goes back to the reading we had last Sunday right, where he tells them your faith has saved you, um, that there is something to be said for the, the people themselves. Um, it says that, so Jesus was, he was not able to perform any mighty deeds there apart from curing a few sick people. He was amazed at their lack of faith uh, because he could not do what he wanted to do because their their lack of faith would not allow it. So there is something in that relationship, and uh, and it, and it's just, of course, I'm sure that was very sad because these are his own people, and you would think that they would they would be so happy that he's he's come back and 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 here he is, um, but but in reality, not 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 so much. Uh, and then I want to I want to touch on this just because I know it's it's for some people it's a it's a constant source of, of of confusion. But when they say, "Is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, um, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us?" That alludes to this idea that Jesus actually had quite a few siblings. Um, but, but that's not what it means in the, in the Greek sense. That's not what it means. That is also not what it means in the Jewish cultural sense. Um, and I'm, I'm going to give you two theories, I guess, and you can, you can pick which one you like best or say, I don't really like any of those. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to add a third, like a, a caveat to all of this as well. So that first. Uh, so here's the problem. When Jesus tells, has Mary at the cross, when he has Mary go to live with John, uh, and he says, you will be his mother and he will be your son. Okay. If he had a bunch of brothers and sisters that were, at, at least if that were alive, that would be a, a cultural impossibility because the expectation is that the, uh, the siblings would take care of their mother. Okay. He would, she would not go off and live with a stranger if he had, if she had children that were living, uh, they would be the ones that would take responsibility uh, for her in her, in her old age, I guess. Uh, at the same time, you also think if these really were Mary's other children, what an insult that would be to say, oh, mom's going to go live with this guy, John, that none of you know. Uh, that obviously that that would not go over well. Um, and I can't imagine Mary wanting to go live with John if she had all these other children that were that were there. So anyways, that, that's kind of the caveat. Uh, the second is that in Jewish culture and in the Greek language, um, there's no differentiation between uh, siblings and extended family. Okay, so you would call your cousins your brothers and sisters. Okay, so so that's one one of the theories as that these were all of uh, these were Jesus's cousins. Uh, probably his first cousins, okay, um, and that would not be there. There would not there would be nothing strange about that about uh, them calling Jesus his cousins, his brothers and sisters. Um, and the second theory, 
and again, you, you take them for what you will. Uh, this one is, it is purely a theory, meaning there's not even anything really linguistic, linguistically to back it up like the other. They can say when in, 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 in the Greek language, in the Hebrew language, in the culture at the time, uh, it's likely they were his, his cousins. Uh, because Mary is not ever, it is never said that she had any more children. And here, if Jesus is the, if, G, if Jesus is her first, then this is implying that she had not only four other sons, but also more than one daughter, because it says his sisters, plural, um, that you would think that would be recorded, right? That Mary had all these other children. Um, so anyway, uh, the, the, other, the other, which I think it is an interesting theory, although there's, like I said, there's nothing really uh, historical to back it up. It's just pure conjecture. Um, a, a, some, a lot of scripture scholars, theologians, even biblical historians, they think that it is, is, is very possible that um, Joseph was a widower when he was, when he married Mary. Um, and that would have been one of the reasons why Joseph was content with not actually being the blood father of any children with Mary, okay? Because as a good Jewish family, uh, you would never, it, it would have been, it would have been scandalous not to have children. They would have thought something was wrong with your family if you didn't have children. Um, and especially for Joseph, everybody would have been asking him, when are, where are your sons? Why don't you have any sons? You know, and especially if they're going around saying, you know, that, you know, if, if, if Jesus is, was immaculate, you know, was, uh, uh, you know, you know, immaculately conceived, right. Conceived by the Holy spirit that Joseph is not his blood father so that would have been uh, as a as a good jewish man joseph would have wanted a son of his own blood to carry on his family name uh, it also would have been very very un unlikely to to just have one child in a, in the jewish culture again there would look like something would have been wrong with you if you only had one child okay um so there is some conjecture that uh, one of the reasons Joseph was okay with all of this is because he was older and possibly a widower uh, when he married Mary and that these brothers and sisters are actually his children from his first wife who died. And so they would be Jesus's stepbrothers and sisters, which is also... Um, certainly plausible how's that and, and part of the way they justify this is by the fact that by the from the time jesus is 12 years old and found in the temple and the time that jesus is 30 years old and begins his public ministry um something happens and joseph is never mentioned again uh and so they think that it is likely that in that time period joseph died uh, and so the reason that Mary would leave her home and travel with her son would be because she certainly would not do that if Joseph was still alive at home. Um, that would have, again, that would have been unconscionable in the Jewish culture. Uh, it would have been scandalous. And, and so anyway, so you do, you do what you will with those theories. Um, so, so there, there you go. Um, so, uh, okay, so, so that kind of said, uh, does anybody have any questions about any of this or any comments about it? Or any thoughts, was the, was the brothers and sisters thing, uh, is, is that still something weighing on you or have we all kind of made our peace with it and moved on or where, where are we with that? Okay. All right. Well, um, let's then, again, keeping in mind what is going on in both of these readings, let's look at Paul. Uh, I, I will tell you too, I think it is uh, Bishop Barron. 
Uh, it may not be. It may be somebody else. And I, I wish I would have found it. I, I it was it was uh, it was on my YouTube feed today. I think it was Bishop Barron, and he's actually got a whole homily on this line in Corinthians about uh, Paul saying um, a thorn in the flesh given to me. Right. He's got a whole he's got a whole sermon on that if you're if you're interested. So here we have Paul. He's writing this letter to the Corinthians, brothers and sisters, that I, Paul, might not become too elated because of the abundance of the revelations, the revel his relationship with God. OK, um, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, an angel of Satan, hyperbole. Um, Paul is not implying uh, no New Testament writer, especially Paul and all of his other writings, ever implies that God, that God would actually send a, a, a demonic entity to, to mess with Christians, to mess with people. Um, but it's hyperbole, but basically is what he's talking. He says to beat me, to keep me from being too elated. <clears throat> and, and basically what he's, what Paul is saying here is so many wonderful things have happened, but yet God has kept pricking at me so that I don't become too complacent, um, so that I don't start to think, which a lot of people did and a lot of people do today, somehow have this idea that because they've become Christian, nothing nothing bad or uncomfortable should ever happen to them again, that somehow their faith is a guarantee against any kind of, of suffering or persecution or misery of any kind. Uh, and then when they do face anything, they immediately say, where is God? Why is God letting, why is this happening to me? Um, and, and part of it too is Paul was very successful in what he was doing, spreading the gospel. So uh, part of it too is this idea that keeping Paul from becoming too elated is keeping Paul, God is pricking him so that Paul never starts to get too prideful that Paul doesn't start to think that it's him who is doing all this, but rather it is the Holy Spirit working through him. Uh, he is working with the Holy Spirit to do all this, but it's not because Paul is so smart or Paul is so wise or Paul is so holy, but rather it is because Paul is allowing the Holy Spirit to work with him and accomplish this. Um, so it, again, it's to avoid pride. So then Paul continues, uh, he says, I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. And, and so when, when Paul is talking about weakness, I don't want you to think he does not mean weakness in the sense of you can't do anything um, or be a doormat, um, just lay down and die kind of weakness. Uh, but he means weakness in realizing our need for God uh, and, and not getting puffed up with pride at our own accomplishments, but rather God's power is then able to be perfected in us when we allow ourselves to be weak and we put aside our own pride and let God work through us um, instead of thinking it's all about us. It's basically... Uh, we have to let go of our ego. And then he says, I will rather boast gladly of my weaknesses in order that the power of Christ may dwell with me. So again, the boasting of our weaknesses would be, again, uh, and, and I want you to think about this, this, this too, and, and this is kind of just a little aside. In Greco-Roman culture, where Paul is in Corinth, in Greco-Roman culture, personal pride was a virtue. Um, the greatest thing that you could do in life in Greco-Roman culture would have been to secure a glorious legacy for yourself and your family. 
okay, so that your name would be remembered, so that people would write songs and poems about you, so that they would build statues of you. Um, so it was very much a culture centered around the idea that you achieve uh, immortality, in a sense, by achieving fame, uh, by achieving personal glory. Uh, and, and so this was very much part of Greco-Roman culture at the time. And so, Paul, so for Paul to say, I will rather boast gladly of my weaknesses is antithetical to the prevailing culture of the time. Um, and this actually lasts a long time in the Christian world, uh, which I think is kind of interesting because, you know, in, in a, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, writings would be anonymous, right? Um, because they did not want to take credit because they wanted God to get the credit. Uh, when, when, uh, when my wife talks about like in architecture, it's very interesting because it's not really until the Renaissance do the architecture, do the architects and engineers start putting their names on things? Because before when they built this cathedral, it was for the glory of God. It didn't matter who you were. You were doing this for the glory of God. It wasn't until the Renaissance, uh, and you started to see the kind of the, the humanism coming in that they started to say, okay, well, sure, we're building something beautiful for God. That's great. But let's not forget, I designed this. Or let's not forget, you know, Brunelleschi, right? Let's not forget, I figured out how to make this dome work when nobody else could. Um, and I want that, I want, I want my name on that. So, a, you know, a th I, I don't even know if Brunelleschi could have imagined that you know, 500 years later, people would still be coming from all over the world to see his work. I, I doubt even he could have imagined that. Um, of course, then there was the Medici's who thought that by hiring Brunelleschi to do this, they were buying their way into heaven. But that's another, that's a, that's a whole nother issue. Um, but, but then I guess that when I think about that, it also does, does make me think that uh, God works in mysterious ways, one, and that even if the Medici's did think they were buying their way into heaven by building the, the, the cathedral, um, they still gave the world something beautiful for God. Uh, and it is still a house of God. And, 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 and so, you know, you hope that there really was something of that in their, uh, in their wanting to do this anyway. Even we are all human. We are all imperfect. Um, but, uh, but just kind of, kind of thinking about that. So, but Paul rather boasting of his weaknesses. Um, he's not going to take credit for what is happening. It's, it's the work of God. Um, Paul is not going to say, you know, let me write a book and sell it and become known as this great orator or this great writer. It's all about God and letting God work through him. So then he says, Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I think this is also something really, really worth kind of meditating on. And I think there is a big, big qualifier that Paul puts in that sentence. He says, I'm content with the weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, comma, for the sake of Christ. If these things are not done for the sake of Christ, they are meaningless. Um, suffering is meaningless if it is not for the sake of Christ, right? It really is meaningless. You know, and I was thinking about this, um, you know, kind of the difference between, say, a, a, a Christian worldview like what Paul is offering and say, a, saying like uh, the, the atheist materialistic worldview in that <clears throat> think about somebody like Maximilian Kolbe, right? In the concentration camp, uh, the Nazis, they, they say, okay, we're going to, we're going to execute this guy. But Maximilian Kolbe knows this, this Jewish man, he knows he's a father. He knows he's a husband. He knows he has a family. Uh, so Maximilian Kolbe offers himself 
in his place. All right. In a Christian sense, we see this. Maximilian Kolbe can endure all of this only because he knows it is for the sake of Christ, for being Christ in the world, right? But if you're an atheist, there would be no reason to do that, to, to willingly suffer hardship and, and, and suffer persecutions and suffer is just stupid. You know, if you were an atheist and, and, and the not, you're just hoping the Nazi guard doesn't point to you. And then when he points the guy next to you, you're just, you know, you're secretly thinking, well, better you than me. Um, because there is no meaning. There is no, there is no, uh, there is no meaning beyond the immediate to suffering, to persecution. However, what Paul is saying, though, is we only suffer these things for the sake of Christ. There is no reason to suffer these things if it is not for the sake of Christ. So we don't need to suffer needlessly or stupidly, but if, if we endure suffering for our faith, there is then merit in it, okay? And that, that is where, the, that is where um, the joyful, the joy can be found even in the midst of suffering. That is where suffering takes on meaning when it serves a higher purpose, um, it's not just suffering for suffering's sake, okay? Um, and then he finally says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And of course, what that means is when I let go of myself and let Christ work in me, that is where I find my true strength. More of you, less of me more of Jesus, less of me. And by me, I don't mean, obviously, uh, and, and I do think this is, you know, sometimes people jump on this and they kind of, I think in confusion, they think, you know, that the idea of the Christian life is to become sort, some sort of automaton that is just a, a, a facsimile of Jesus. And, and we're, we're just kind of like, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, like a ghost in the machine kind of thing. That, that, that's not it at all. Um, God created us and we are created with an individuality and a personality and Christ works in each one of us in a particular way so that it is, it's the paradox of faith that the more we let go of ourselves, the more we actually find ourselves. Uh, the more we let Christ work in us, the more we find out who we truly are. Uh, it's the, again, like what Jesus said, when Jesus says, he who seeks to save his life will lose it. He who loses, he who willingly loses his life will then save it. That's, that's the idea that if we seek to save our lives by becoming egotistic and turning in on ourselves, uh, we find that we just become this shriveled remnant of what we should be. But rather, the more we give of ourselves, the more we find we're, we're actually a more full, a fuller person. We're a more complete person. Um, I think you could really illustrate this if you think about it. You know, think about the idea of, uh, you know, the old adage, the cliche of it's better to give than to receive. But there's something to that. Um, I, I would imagine, especially all of, all of you guys, um, but I would imagine, you know, you probably, I know I certainly do, you get more joy out of giving someone a gift that they truly enjoy than you do by receiving a gift. Not to say that we don't all like getting something every now and then, but, but the real joy is in giving a spouse or a friend or a child or a grandchild a gift and just seeing their eyes light up. That, that, does, that, that, is more, that means more to you than all the gifts that you're going to receive, right? I hope it does. Um, or, you know, think about like the idea of spending the time preparing a beautiful meal for your family and having everyone sit down and seeing that they really enjoy it, right? That means more to you than if somebody said, you know, than, than just sitting in a, sitting in, you know, in a really nice restaurant eating by yourself right? Because it's the giving of yourself. Um, sorry, I don't want to get all 
get all we'll get all weirdo spiritual if we keep going with not weirdo but you know what i mean we're it's it's the idea that the more we give of ourselves the more we find ourselves and this is this is a lot of what paul is talking about that it is only in being willing to let go of our ego and let go of our desire for notoriety for fame uh, our pride um, for recognition uh, but rather we should be happy knowing that God's work is being done even if our name is not the first one in the article or you know our name is not the one that's mentioned at the award ceremony um, but rather God gets the glory uh, so again just just something something to think about okay um, you guys got any thoughts comments questions nothing all right well I, I that's really all i've got unless you've got something so um going once jason. yes jason this is cynthia yeah, go ahead. um when, when you talk about um you know giving is is more so when i went to the axe retreat i thought what could possibly be better than this but when i served on the team i think i found the answer no, and, and I think I think you're, and, and and I, you know, I I have for years, for years, I've been trying to put my finger on why people, and not, and and, and I'm saying, not just the axe retreat, but I know, and, I, and like, because I can see Becky right now, and I know like Becky helping out with RCIA, RCIA, right? You know, and and the people, and you know, why year after year after year, people keep coming back to serve on these teams, to serve in these ministries, because I think like, well, one, RCIA never stops. Um, and I think like, you know, acts, my goodness, you know, you're talking about months and months and months of a commitment to put on a two day or three day retreat, right? Uh, for the, and, and why do people keep coming back to this? And I think it's because it is true. There is something about seeing someone light up for that moment um because when 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 you have uh because you have and all these other people have have given so much of themselves right and the reward in that moment is to see that 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 light i guess if, if you would maybe that's if that and and i oh i, to, I totally i i agree with you 100 percent um i love being part of retreats um i love helping helping with retreats and and and, and doing all that because it's uh I feel like I get, I get a lot, I get a lot out of it. Um, and, uh, and I, I feel the same way with RCIA that, you know, people, somebody, you know, after, after all the years that I've been doing RCIA, does it ever get old? And the answer is no, not, not at all. Um, in fact, it's, it's, I, 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 I love doing it. Um, so, so yeah, and well, and hopefully, well, hopefully we're getting ready to start doing retreats again. So all you guys just, you know, hopefully that, hopefully that's coming sooner than later. Um, but but I but I do think that's a big part of it. And I think and I think people want to give back. I, I think that's what it is. I think when you've been given something so wonderful, if you have a Christian heart, um, when you've been given something so wonderful, the 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 next step is is immediately the desire to to give that back um and and i say that because i you know i i i i know all of you that are here and i see you around and i see how much you you are willing to give of yourselves and participate in the life of the parish and and in the various things that go on around here and uh and and just so you it does not go unnoticed how's that it it, it, it sometimes it may seem like a thankless job, but well, at least I'm noticing it anyway. I and 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 uh, and, and and it inspires me, and so I think there's also that too. It's like we don't realize how we we almost kind of feed off of each other. Um, you know that 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 you know I like like again working with the the men for the retreats, and and doing all of that, um, and working with with Becky and everybody for RCIA. I get as much, I, I get as much out of working with them. I hope they get something out of working with me, but I, I, I probably get 
at least as much as anyone else does just by being around everybody. And like, again, going on retreat with the guys and stuff like that. I get as much out of that, I think, as anybody does that's actually on the retreat. Um, so, so hopefully we'll get back to it sooner than later. CIA, you have the bonus is it's not a one and done. I mean, you know, once you get them through the process and they decide to join the church, then hopefully they'll become an active member. Not some people disappear, but it's very rewarding to see them go up as a Eucharistic minister or be a lector or <clears throat> teach Sunday school or something like that, uh, you know, and come with their family or their whole family now can go up to, to communion yep. together instead of the husband or the wife sitting in the pew or whatever. So, I mean, there's a lot of uh, rewards that you get and every group is so completely different. It's almost like teaching. It's Dennis is on the. <laughs> he taught at UH Clear Lake too. But just like every class is different, even teaching the same course, it's the same way with RCIA. I mean, this group is very different than the the guys that went through the last time. You know, it's a great. It's a whole different ball game. Even though some of the information might be the same, but a lot of the uh, the dynamics are very different. So how about, how about that? I'll kind of, I'll kind of leave you with that. Um, something to think about, you know, especially as, you know, we're coming to mass, um, you know, Sunday and we're, we're hearing the readings again, we're hearing the homilies and we're hearing it all within the prayer of the liturgy, you know, something to kind of think of that, you know, as, as the parish is trying to get back up and moving again, um, thinking about, you know, when, you know, when the time comes for, you know, the, I, I think, I, I, I think, so don't hold me to this. I think they are going to try to do, or at least start the process for a women's retreat in the fall, maybe. I, I don't, I don't know. I think, um, and I know, like I said, Matthew and I are trying to, to do some stuff. I, I, I'm sure the men of the cross are going to want to do something as soon as they can, besides the monthly meetings, but they're going to want to, to try to look at something. So just, just kind of look, look for the, say, you know, look for those opportunities. How can I, how can I in some way give back what I have received? Um, so just that we'll kind of, and we'll kind of end with that, just something to kind of think about. And I'm not saying that you guys are not doing that a lot already. You are, but, uh, but just something to think about. Okay. All right, well, let's go. If there's no, no, nothing else. We'll go ahead and close. All right, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And I will see you all this weekend or next week. So take care and have a, have a good fourth. Be safe. <laughs>